Hello, my name's Ken and what we've got today is a video about the Pearl Mallet Station EM1 and in particular for a prospective buyer or new user to give them some more information about this piece of equipment so that A, they know what they're going to be buying and B, that when they do get it, the setup process and the initial getting it to play process is a whole lot more um, pain free, shall we say, than perhaps they'd have you believe when they sell you it. This is a bit of a niche instrument, there aren't many around. Um, looking at the serial number on this, I don't think Pell make that many. And certainly a, a significant proportion of them seem to have quality control issues of some sort or other, in particular key consistency and sort of other key related issues. And we'll get to them as we go through the, the video. However, it is what it is, it's a jack of all trades. Right, if you want a five octave marimba look and feel and all the nuances that go with that, then go and buy yourself a five octave marimba, it's that simple. This is not going to be that, it's not going to come close to that and it doesn't pretend to. It's a multi-purpose instrument that's designed to cover a whole lot of bases and it actually does it quite well within the, the, the sort of limits of what we can expect a jack of all trades to do but it's not going to do anything exceptionally well, so that's something you need to be aware of. The second thing you need to be aware of is that this is not actually a musical instrument. Okay? This is what's known as a MIDI controller, and this is nothing more than a box of buttons. It's maybe laid out like a mallet keyboard, but it's actually just a box of buttons. And all that happens is when I hit one of these keys, it registers first of all which key's been hit, secondly how hard it's been hit. And what that does is send a signal to my sound source, which in this case will be my MacBook, and it tells the software in there what note to play. This is incapable of producing sound. So if you think you're going to buy one of these and plug your headphones in and start playing away, you're going to be really, really disappointed. And I know a few people have done that. Okay, so just right away from the start, this is not a musical instrument, it's a MIDI controller. There is a very significant difference. Moving on a little bit from that then, I will sort of add in here that I'm nothing to do with Pearl um, or any musical retailer or anything to do with the commercial um, music industry. I'm a lay player, like probably 95% of the people watching this video. So I've gone through all the heartache that you've gone. Um, I have used one of these live and it actually did very well. But like I say, it had to go back because it just wasn't performing the way it should have done. So what we're going to look at is what we need to do to set this up, what comes with it and what we might need to acquire to go with it okay? because it's just not quite that straightforward. First thing to look at then is when we get the box, make sure the box isn't damaged etc etc, it hasn't been thrown around the back of a van and I would keep the box just in case you find you have to return it. Next thing is to inspect the equipment itself and make sure it's not damaged and just have a general look, make sure, feel everything, nothing's loose. It's all as it should be, and it is in this case. Also in the box we get a couple of other things. We get a load of these, and these are known as gap caps. Um, and these are, allow us to lay onto different keys to change the keyboard, to basically transpose the keyboard up and down a note at a time. And the way we accomplish that within the actual equipment is with these two buttons here at the far end, and they will shift it up and down note by note. Um, quite frankly, I think that's pretty pointless. The, the equipment also has the ability to octave transpose. So why I'd want to move up and down one note at a time is a little bit beyond me. Perhaps some of you more proficient, uh, professional proficient players out there will be able to shed a bit of light on why I'd want that to become a G or an E at the bottom rather than just leaving it as it is and shifting up and down an octave. So these are just a little bit of a gimmick I think and more importantly it's just more to go wrong. More to lose and more to be frustrated about. But it does show you how to lay these out and when they're properly laid out they will be laid out in the manner of a mallet keyboard as we see there. So that's the gap caps. Coming with it also you will get a USB lead, which is this. Um, this is 
a USB B, which is a computer fitting that people are familiar with for printers, etc., and to a USB A, which is a fairly standard USB fitting. Fairly standard that is, unless you have a newer iPad, an older iPad, or some of the newer um, PCs and laptops, which are all coming with a USB C fitting, right? So, in order to use this with some types of sound source, um, iPad, laptop, etc., you may need a different cable. You can achieve that in one of two ways. You can get an adapter to change this to whatever it needs to be, or you can get a completely different cable. Now, what I will say is if you are going to use an iPad that's got a lightning adapter on it, you will need one of these. This is an on-the-go camera converter for an Apple iPad. It will also work on an iPhone. What I would say is that there are many of these available at significantly differing prices on various outlets on the internet. Save yourself a lot of pain and grief and get the Apple one. Because this isn't just a straightforward hardwired conversion there's actually some electronics in here doing stuff as well that are probably not present in many of the other ones. And I speak from personal experience here because I did have some other equipment that I was trying to work from uh, an iPad and it just wouldn't play until we got the proper Apple connector. So that's one of the first links in the system where we've got potential for things to go wrong. Rather than use adapters as well, I've purchased a good quality USB-B to USB-C cable. The more adapters and things you have in a system, the more there is to go wrong and the more scope there is for interference and other sorts of issues creeping in. This is a good quality one. You get what you pay for with computer cables. It's as simple as that. Okay. This one's also got chokes on it there, which are there to reduce um, any interference that might be picked up. So it's going to give a cleaner signal. So make sure that you've got the right cable that you need and it's a good quality cable. Right? All USB cables are not created equal. Some of the cheaper ones that are designed for recharging purposes only, for example, are only wired to provide a power line. Some of them are only designed to work one way with a signal. Right? We need one that will provide power and will work both ways with USB. So it needs to be a good quality cable. So that's the second bit of hearty you can save yourself is buy some decent quality cables for your equipment. The one supplied is perfectly fine, as you'd expect, um, but a lot of aftermarket stuff is quite frankly just a waste of money. You, you get what you pay for. So that's the cable that comes in the box. The next thing that comes in the box is the user manual. <laughs> right, the user manual, yeah. Um, quite frankly, this is pointless. It also lacks some significant information, in particular the hardware and software requirements that you require from the sound source to operate this equipment. Right. It also gives a quick bit about MIDI, a, a MIDI primer, a quick MIDI primer. Well, it is a really quick MIDI primer. Right. This system works in a system called MIDI, Musical Instrument Digital Interface which is a means of electronically transferring information between musical instruments and interfaces. Right. MIDI is actually a, quite a complex subject and Pearl assume when you buy this equipment that you have some knowledge of it. Right. And certainly when we come to programming it and making it do what we want in a more sophisticated way, our knowledge of MIDI is absolutely essential. And this is probably the first place that people fall down with this equipment is because many people purchasing this equipment are either learning an instrument or their acoustic players who are looking to go into the sort of digital side of things, they've never come across MIDI. Right? And MIDI, I can assure you, is a bit more complex than these two paragraphs there. Okay. Here is a MIDI manual. Right? That's how complex MIDI is. You don't need to know all of that, but you certainly probably should be aware of what's in the first two or three chapters of a book like this, okay. because it is absolutely essential 
when you come to setting up things like your programming keys and whatever, that you understand what the MIDI codes being sent and received are actually doing. So MIDI knowledge is a bit of a requirement here. And like I say, it also doesn't really go into much about anything else at all, really. There is an online software um, editor which allows you to set up and program the machine. You can either download it or use it online. And it says here, many of the more advanced options and settings in the Mallet Station can be accessed through the software editor available at pearlmalletstation.com. It then goes on to say, most casual users will not need to install this editor, but we recommend booking, mark, bookmarking it for future use. Right, that is absolute nonsense. You cannot use this machine effectively without having that editor, in particular to do the key regulation process. Okay. So I would just throw that in the bin. What there is though, there's an online manual on the Perl website, which is about 20 pages long. It's a lot more in detail, a lot more comprehensive, and it's got some really, really important information in it about particularly the hardware and software requirements that you need for this equipment and how to set it up. So I wouldn't even waste my time looking at that little side of A4. Get the online manual from the Perl uh, website, download it, either print it out or read it, but go through it thoroughly so that you really understand what you're dealing with here. And that will make your life a whole lot easier, trust me, a whole lot easier. I can't stress enough, you must look at that manual. So that's what comes in the box. The next thing we want to do is to check the functionality of the equipment. So the first thing I'm going to do is take my lead. Now, on a USB-B lead, there's a small lip just on the edge here. Right. This is quite a tight uh, fitting. One of the issues that I'm sure people have is when they're plugging that in, they're not pushing it fully home, right? So they're therefore not getting a full and proper connection. When you push this into the USB socket in the back of the mallet station, make sure it goes fully home and that little lip is fully engaged. The other end, straight into the laptop. And the first thing that we should see immediately is we get some lights coming on on the right hand side. Okay. That is an indication that we've now got power applied to the system. So that's your first check is that we've got power applied. We're not interested in any other software or what software we're using yet. We just want to see that it's accepting power and it's um, basically booting itself up properly. If those lights don't light up, then we've got a bit of an issue somewhere. Um, the first thing I would do is swap out the cable for a known high quality good one. Okay, first thing. Second thing is I would try an alternative USB power source, um, another laptop or another pad or whatever, just get hold of one, borrow one off somebody um, and just plug it in and see if that works. If you do all that and then you're still not getting lights on there, it probably means there's an issue with the equipment. So we now know we've got power. The next thing I want to do is check that all the keys are actually responding. And to do this, we do have to go into some software. We're not interested in bar regulation or anything yet, but what I am interested in at the moment is making sure that everything is actually sounding. So to do that, I'm gonna go into probably the most basic of the, the options available, which is garage band. Now, people would say, well, why are, you, why are you using garage band? And there's all sorts of stuff like main stage and digital. Garage band is simple, it's straightforward, and we know it works. Okay, it's also available on all Macs. I tend to use Macs because they're a more, I find them a more stable platform, and the music industry tends to favour Mac uh, systems, and most of the better quality software for musical use is Mac orientated. That said, there, um, there almost certainly will be uh, packages available on other. Um, operating platforms and operating systems that will do the job just as well. Okay, so we're going to go into GarageBand and we're just going to bring the... So you should now start seeing on the screen what I'm doing to get to this. And as it's booting up Oh, 
we're going to create just a simple straightforward new track just a new project and we could create a MIDI instrument what that instrument is actually doesn't matter at this stage because all I'm interested in doing is making sure that this is talking to this. Okay. It's telling me I've got classic electric piano. So now when I hit a key, I should get a response. Now you'll notice that when I hit the gap caps, there's no response. That's because the keyboard is configured that way at the minute. So what I'm going to do is just shift it up a note. I now get the gap caps doing the thing and the note just below them is now dead. Okay. So that's the single note transposition. So, so we're just basically going up through all the keys, making sure I've got a response and I can see on the system the two green bars moving across the level of that response coming through. So I now know that all the keys are working. The next thing I need to check is the consistency of the keys and this is really important because this is why my last one went back. And what I need to do now is just very quickly go and grab a stick. So what I've got here is just a simple vibraphone stick. And what we're looking for is the individual response on different parts of the key. So for example, if I hit the key there, top, center and bottom, I should get the same response. And that's important to go through all the keys in the system, including the gap cap keys, making sure you're getting that level response across the key. Okay. Otherwise, when we're playing the instrument, sometimes you'll hit a note, sometimes you won't hit a note. And that's not helpful at all. Okay. So having done all that, we're now satisfied that the, the equipment, the hardware anyway, is pretty much working functionally. Um, you will have noticed there's probably some slight inconsistencies in the keys, and that's because we haven't done a thing called key regulation yet. And we're just going to do that now. So to do the key regulation process, we need to leave GarageBand and go into the Pearl Station EM1 editor. Which is down here somewhere. And we now get this screen coming up. Full screen. Now on the screen there we can see that there's a whole lot of stuff going on but down at the bottom in the centre is a thing called globals and the right hand box of that says bar regulation open. Right. Now in the Perl operator's manual for this equipment it actually shows an older version of this where the bar by bar regulation is on the left of the velocity curves rather than on the right of it and it's slightly different and it just allows you to do a single bar at a time. The global one here, the bar regulation allows you to do it all as a one-up. So we're going to open that up and we see a layer of the keyboard and the first key is blue and it's also got illuminated soft tap. And what it requires you to do is five simple taps and you'll get a tone. If they're all consistent then it'll do you a ring. If they're not consistent and you're going it won't. So we'll start recording and we'll see what happens. Okay, so that's the proper tone we get and it'll automatically move on to the next bar. If I do a wrong hit, it gives me that to tell me I'm not being consistent in my hits. And the hits you should be doing at this point are the softest that you would reasonably expect to play. So for example, for a very soft piano passage. 
and we go all the way up the system doing that till we get to the far end and then it takes us on to doing the regulation for the harder keys okay. so rather than having you listen to all of that I'm just going to cut the video here and we're going to go on to moving between the softer keys and the harder keys okay, so when you've got to the far end of the bar regulation process up here and you've done your soft hits it will take you right back down to the other end and the bottom F here will become blue again. We're now looking for the hard hitch. And you'll now see that the box um, labelled hard strike is now illuminated on the bottom of the screen. And it's now asking us to hit it a bit more firmly. Now, there is a Pearl video that shows uh, somebody doing this and he's absolutely leathering the things. Now remember, what this is doing is regulating the bars on the system. The softest hit is going to be registering zero, the hardest hit is going to register 127 okay, and varying hits in between. So what I've found that for consistency in playing, rather than absolutely leathering it, I'm just going to hit these as hard as I would normally expect to hit it in a loud passage of playing. including the gap caps and again I'll not put you through the pain of having to sit and watch me do all that we'll take it right to the end okay so when you've got to the end of the bar regulation process and hit the last bar you'll get a kind of funny sound off the software editor and it'll then ask you if you want to save that information which I will and we'll overwrite the previous one so what I've now done is I've regulated the bars so they should all be producing a pretty similar response when we're playing there's one other thing we need to check on this and that is that it actually plays chords because the previous one I had did not play simultaneous notes so to do that we just need to go into whatever software we think we're going to use for this let's go very quickly bring up the main stage which is what I normally use we'll talk more about that shortly and go into one of my files let's see what kind of instrument we'll play okay so we've got a the xylophone not getting any response from that okay. the reason I'm not getting any response from that is because we're still in editor mode in the mallet station editor and the reason I knew that is because this light was still moving backwards and forwards along here okay. So it's now playing and sounding as it should do and something that will play, normally play chords on. I'm just going to look to play to see if we're actually going to get simultaneous notes out of this. Okay. So And I can see actually on the uh, main stage program that I'm actually hitting both keys at the same time. And it's registering the simultaneous hits. So I can actually play chords on this as well, which I couldn't do on the previous one I had. So that's the initial user checks that I would go through on this to make sure it's actually doing what it should be doing. And as you'll notice there, even, even for me, um, the first time I hit it, nothing happened. Okay. The issue there was the fact that I'd actually not closed out of the mallet station editor and it was still working away. And that little red light traveling backward and forward there was the key to that. Okay, so don't immediately assume that because something doesn't happen, the instrument's not working properly. Nine times out of 10, it's gonna be something like that on the software. So that concludes the initial setup of the equipment. Okay, so what we're going to do now is we're going to show you 
one of the most basic bits of software to use are this one, which is GarageBand. And this is absolutely ideal for home practice or for learning for education type purposes. Um, and it's simple, it's effective, and it does what it says in the box. So what I'm doing here is we've got a screen grab going on and I'm just gonna create a new, a whole new project. Don't wanna save the changes to the one that's up there. I'm gonna go for an empty project and we're just gonna choose it. So software instrument and create. So we've now got an empty box there which says classic electric piano. We can leave it as that or we can move it on to something else. So just by going down to the bottom here, we can bring up all the options available. So let's look at mallets. Um, we've got a bit of marimba here. And We've now got the sound we're looking for. Um, if we want to change it to something else, vibraphone. Right. You'll notice that we're actually getting exactly the same sound here. Now, again, this is a common problem that people have, and there's a reason for that, and that's because we haven't closed out the other software that we were using. Okay. We've still got main stage running, and main stage thinks it's doing something else. So. One of the key important things you need to understand about this sort of kit is that you can only have one bit of software open at a time. Okay. Close out the extra bit of software. You can hear we're straight back into vibraphone and a nice marimba. Okay. So make sure when you're setting up obviously for practice as well, but especially for live performance. Make sure that you've got no internet connection, no Bluetooth connection, and every other piece of software you can disable closed out. Okay? You only want one piece of software running all the time when you're trying to do this. And that's one of the biggest causes, as you saw there, of difficulties when people are trying to get instruments playing, there's usually something else running in the background. Okay, so make sure you've only got that one piece of software running. Okay. Garage band, simple, straightforward. You can either use it live, you could put that into a headphone output or into an, an output to somewhere else. Um, and you can, you can use that perfectly well live. And it's got a reasonable range of instruments on it. It's got, um, percussive instruments, it's got orchestral percussion. So we've got a glockenspiel, for example. So we've got glockenspiel, marimba, some basic stuff to get us going there. Bit limited though, um, for anything other than basic home practice, I would suggest though. So that's garage band, pretty simple, straightforward, and it works. The other thing about GarageBand is it's available on all the Mac platforms, that, from the oldest to the newest, okay? and it's, it's pretty much the same throughout. Moving on then, I'll just completely close out the GarageBand. I won't bother saving that. Um, the industry standard is probably main stage. Um, love it or hate it, it is what people tend to use, what people tend to know, and certainly the most adaptable for on uh, on stage use. So if I bring up main stage now and we look at it, we can see that we've got three options at the top. We've got layout, edit and perform. At the minute we're in edit and that allows us to set up a performance. It also allows us to um, change some bits and pieces round about. Uh, for example, if I want to add an instrument to that list, I just click on the add up at the top and down in the bottom of the patch settings, it gives me a whole list of things to do. Let's go into instrument and what do I want here? We'll have orchestral percussion. Um, what have I not got there? 
my mallet. That's with marimba. And there's my marimba there. When we go into perform mode, it only shows us the central screen here, and that's what we'd use on stage. And we can toggle through our patches um, either using the buttons here, left and right, because it takes me up and down through the patches, or I can do it with the foot pedal as well. And I normally do it with the foot pedal. Okay. Now, what I would say about, mal about um, the mallet station and main stage is there is a mallet station template available for main stage. I would very strongly suggest that you get it and you use it. It saves you a whole lot of effort and if, particularly if you have no MIDI knowledge whatsoever, um, you're almost certainly going to have to use that template. It just It's all there for you. I mean, even, even for an experienced user like me, um, uh, and, you know, somebody that knows a bit about MIDI, why should I do the work when somebody else has already done it for me? So download the template and do use it. It's just going to make your life so, so much easier. The other thing about main stage is it needs the, probably one of the more current operating systems in the Mac system, and there's no legacy versions available. So if, again, going back to what we said about the initial equipment in terms of you know, what you need to run the software, editing software and the actual equipment itself. Main stage itself also requires a pretty upmarket version of the operating system. And if you've got an older Mac or whatever, it ain't gonna play. It's also sadly not available on anything other than the Mac platform. Okay. And they don't do a legacy version of it. So if you've got an old uh, MacBook and it's got an older operating system and you can't upgrade it, then you're probably not gonna be using main stage, I'm afraid. But it is the kind of industry standard, it's what I use when I'm playing live, and it really it is pretty hassle-free. Once you get it set up and get your instruments in there, just keep it simple, simple as that. So main stage, probably the industry standard, but you do need an upmarket Mac to run it. If we go into the more advanced stuff, we can go into digital audio workstations and the one I use is Ableton. Well, one of the ones I use, I've got Ableton and Cubase. And what we're getting into here is a whole new world of pain. So a couple of sides where I just let Ableton come up and make sure I'm closed out of everything else and we'll show you what a digital uh, audio workstation looks like. So this is what the Ableton user interface looks like. Um, I had a bit of a giggle at the Pearl website who described this as easy to use and intuitive. Okay. Right. What we're doing here is we're, we're taking a quantum leap really from something that is designed for performance to something that is designed for music creation. This is pretty much the remit of the music professional uh, the composers, etc., and and people sort of doing multiple tracks. It does hugely increase the number of options available to you, in, in terms of your ability to to layer stuff and play multiple instruments and multiple outputs, etc., and apply effects to stuff. But as a live performance, would I use it? No, I probably wouldn't. There's just too much there that's going to go wrong. Um, it does say it can be used live, and I'm sure it's very good if you. You're, if you're willing to do that, um, but I much prefer the simpler options of main stage. There is a lot going on here, as you can see, it's multiple tracks, multiple things going on. Um, it does give us a very, very wide range of instruments, and we can also start to use things called plugins, which is where we're dragging in samples and instruments from other bits of uh, bits of software um, or other sources all into one. So this is this is really a means of sort of creating and combining stuff uh, and I would suggest I'd be using it for that rather than performing. There are a lot of things in here to catch you out and in, in particular you know when we look at the channel strips there um, there's all sorts of stuff that isn't obvious. If you look at that slider being moved for example um, that could be the difference between hearing what you're playing or not hearing what you're playing and 
just the knowledge of how it all works is something you really have to spend a lot of time to get your head around. There are some superb tutorials online for this. It's a really widely used industry standard, um, but there's lots of others around like Cubase, etc., Presonus. Um, they're, they're all good. They all do the job, but you really have to be enthusiastic to get into this and you really have to know what you're doing to even think about using it live. So for those of you who want to go that way, give it a go. Um, there's a lot to learn, but it really, really is versatile. If all you want to do is play your mallet station and perform with it, I would suggest this is probably not the way you want to go. Um, the mantra here being, keep it simple. Okay, so finally, uh, as part of this, showing the sample tank, which is um, the kind of recognised software for using with an iPad. As you can see, we've got the, the iPad adapter here, the Apple adapter. Um, again, not quite as straightforward as some would have you believe. You've actually got to pay to download any sort of useful instruments here. But as you can see, it's registering the keys and the them, um, and that would be giving any output required to headphones or whatever. Don't actually have an instrument selected at the minute, so we'll select one. Okay, so I've got fives here. Okay. So another quite useful tool, um, and mainly for the sort of iPad um, or tablet sort of scenario, but really good, really useful. Um, so that concludes uh, the basic sort of setup of the mallet station. Um, things to look out for, things to be aware of, and hopefully some of the pitfalls to avoid. And a very, very quick look at some of the software. Um, I haven't spent a lot of time with it, just to, to, to go into that. There's a lot of tutorial material provided by the manufacturers of the, the software, like Mainstage and Ableton, um, Cubase, all that sort of stuff. Also, it is worth spending your time getting your head around it. Whatever you decide to use, make sure you're fully conversant with it and with how it all works together. Okay? The mallet station is just one part of a big chain and if any parts of those chain are, are not right, then nothing's going to be right. So it can be frustrating at times when you wonder what's going on. Um, I do get still get times when it just occasionally hangs for no reason and the things I find that are useful are just just simply just unplug the mallet station, plug it back in, seems to reboot it most of the time. Um, if that doesn't work then just restart the PC with it all connected up. Because one of the other things about MIDI systems is they are a little bit pernickety about the manner and order in which they're connected up, so that's just something to be aware of. Other than that, um, as I say I hope you found this useful and even for the more seasoned professional and knowledgeable players that are out there, um, and there are a lot of people out there who know an awful lot more about this stuff um, than I do. I hope you've gained something from it and uh, any constructive feedback or any constructive comments or anything you can add to, to the party to help other people will always be welcome. Thanks. <laughs>